now their mindset where I actually have to connect with in order for me to grow and become the man I am today. Now, you know, when you grew up in an environment, there's a lot of, uh, there's poverty, obviously. And there's, uh, cause in early days, my, my parents got divorced and, uh, leave me and my brother, uh, with our dad. And we have to navigate through that. And that's one thing I did not want to have. I did not want to grow in a family where I have to experience is what I had to experience. My mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive. My man, Doherty, what does this mean? Man, you know what? For me, it means I'm not just here to live an okay life, but to make the best out of every opportunity. Uh, my story behind this pro is because uh, I remember uh, growing up as a young kid where I came from in a place where it's, it's, it's a lot of struggle. I mean, a lot of uh, ups and down, a lot of chaos, gang violence. And uh, from an early age, I noticed it's something that I did not want. I did not want to be angry. I don't want to mimic the same um, environment. And from that time, I've realized, you know what? There has to be a better way out. There has to be something better than this. And of course, being a kid, I didn't know what that mean. I know that I did not want to get shot because there's a lot of great opportunities out there. Uh, but that's become the um, the pillars of my life. I want to be better. I want to be better whenever that opportunity presenting to me. Granted, I was uh, back in Haiti. It was like, OK, you know what? It's nearly impossible. But that type of uh, mindset ingrained to me to the point where like, you know, I would not okay to survive just to be here but i want to attain the next level which is want to get better every day what were you this is awesome like thanks for this yeah. uh because i know that there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of feel good fathers that are going to identify with this that there's going to be some piece of it that's re, that's reminded of them one of my stories is i was growing up in toronto and through silly happenstance. I was very young. Me and my buddies, we all had the wrong kind of bandana on. We were on the wrong kind of street corner. And we were like, we were literally like 30 seconds away from having a confrontation. And we were not in a gang or in like that, but we were just in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time of night with the wrong dress. And it was just like, oh, it's this crazy story. And I can't imagine, because that ended up being super well, I can't imagine being in an environment and I'm grateful that I've grown up in a place where that wasn't an environment where I grew up. But at this young age, you had this concept of want to be better. What I'm really interested in knowing is um, how did that manifest for you in Haiti? And then like, what did you do? Like, what was the next step? Like what happened? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> this is really, really, really uh, going back with, uh, wanting to uh looking for opportunities to making sure i maximize it now granted i know that being in a poor country i mean obviously according to the uh to the status that been publishing by the uh by different organizations that we probably one of the country the poorest country in the western he uh, hemis uh, i can't even say that word but in that western <laughs> Uh, well, let me put it that way. <laughs> sure, so, perfect. so, so in that regard that we know that disadvantage, it's actually real. So what I have to do is just, okay, you know what? I have to accept the reality that one, it is the environment, but also what can I do in that moment to making sure that whenever an opportunity present to me, I could go for it. So for example, I know as, as a kids, we all have to go to school. And that's one of the things my father says, hey, you know what? The best gift I could give you is just to making sure you go to school, which is great. I'm grateful for that. Now, granted, there's other skill set that in the part of that process I have to uh, I have to learn, such as like, you know what? How can I actually be grateful, but also knowing that I cannot be content to where I'm at? And I'm starting to say, okay, you know what? Yes, this is the reality for me, but also what can I do to make sure that I'm not accepting that type of life? So fast forward, 
my father, uh, which is, uh, he's a, he's a great man. I love my father and he did the best he can with the tools that he has. And, and, and I watched my father, uh, work hard to provide for the family. That's one thing I, I learned from my father that, uh, working hard, that's something that I mimic from him till today. Now, uh, as a young man, the thing that sometimes that get me really, uh, uh, really move is that he would never, ever live us to the point where he's not provide to the point where he's not give us, uh, financially, he's not responding to those needs, which is those are the, the principle I get from my father. But also the part that, that I, I've, I learned around that community I was part of is just like, you know what? Um, uh, we have to do the best we can with what we have. And that's one another mindset where I actually have to connect with in order for me to grow and become the man I am today. Now, you know, when you grew up in an environment, there's a lot of uh, there's poverty, obviously. And there is because uh, in early days, my, my parents got divorced and uh, leave me and my brother uh, with our dad. And we have to navigate through that. And that's one thing I did not want to have. I did not want to grow in a family where I have to experience what I had to experience. Is one time on the book I talk about in my book that my father went on a business trip. He left me with his girlfriend. She stole everything in the house. I was full. And she's abandoned. She's actually abandoning me and my brother and take everything, Jay. And we get to the point where it was like a, a neighbor, like a good Samaritan that actually see me and my brother and they took us over and the, the, the provide shelter for us until our father came back. That actually marked me. That's something I just like, you know what? I would never, never want something like that happen to my kids. And that marked oh until goodness. today. Okay. Uh, what a, I mean, okay. What did you learn from that? Like what, what's the lesson, the wisdom that you extracted from that experience? Well, you know, Jay, I, I, the, the, the wisdom I got from this one is that, um, you know what? There is that little kid who would never want to be abandoned no matter what and and that actually give me it's it's actually stirs in me what we call like a whole nother um in addition to says you could you know what i would never leave my kids in a position to experience that i'm not saying they're not going to experience others other other things in life but not that one all right. That's awesome. Um, I think what a, what a great lesson, I think taking that personal responsibility and really uh, taking ownership of the, the safety and the providing and protection of your kids. That's something that any feel good father can really align with and, um, and understand. So what else have you taught your kids from your experience? Or maybe a, a better question is what are some values that you're imparting to your kids um, given your experience and given what you learned from your father? Yeah, uh, well, one of the things we we call this knowing the brand builder framework. I mean, I've, I've, I've kind of like put a framework together. So I was like, that framework would help me a lot. So the framework is just pretty much uh, take percent, take 100% responsibility for your action. Meaning like if they do something, I don't, I, I don't mind if you do something, you know, because by the way, my kids, I, I have a, a, a teen daughter, a preteen, uh, my, my oldest daughter, she's 14. Uh, and my middle daughter, she's uh, 12, going to be 13 in a couple of weeks and next week or so. And my son, which is 11. So from, from the get go, I know that in order for me to help them grow to become the men and women, I believe that they want to be in this world. There's this principle I want to pass along to them. It means when they made a mistake, which is they're going to make a mistake. So when they do, pretty much just like owns your mistake from the get-go. That's one thing my father taught me. He says, son, you know what? Always making sure you own your mistake. It doesn't matter if you're blood. It doesn't matter if you done something wrong. Always know that I'm your father. Nobody will fight for you. I'm always going to be there. But make sure that you know why you own your staff. Meaning like, you know what? If something happened, you cross the line. Yeah, yeah, I did cross the line. And the second thing after you own it, what did you learn from it? 
So it's me like, you know what? Okay, now you go from owning, but but okay, it happened. So what did you learn in terms of like, okay, you know what? What what are something I could have done different? So this is where I give him a little space to actually really process their behavior, their action, what happened. And and the last step I tell them, okay, you know what? Now you own it, you learn it, but what can you do different next time? So this is the question I ask him all the time, okay? And okay, I understand it happened. You learn from this. Okay, what can you do to making sure you not repeat that again? Those are the elements I put around in my house. And anybody that that have kids, I always try to pass that framework to them, tell them, hey, those are the things I use. My kid is not perfect, but I learned that from my father from the get-go, uh, uh, even though the, not the last two part, but the ownership is just like what I believe that would lead me to see the kids I have today. As a young father, Jay, it is it is a lot. Sometimes for me, it's just like, man, I want my kids to have the best life as possible, but be the best kids where they could make an impact on the world. But when we come to mm-hmm. things like that, we actually, I mean, I find that for me is just like, you know what, my kids are going to mess up, but when they messed up, how can I approach them from a loving fatherling way, father way to know that, hey, I'm not against you, but I'm for you. But I want you to know that, you know, there's certain things that you could do better. Got it. Love it. Um, that growth mindset, right? That radical ownership. That's really great. Yeah. Or extreme ownership, right? Like really good, yeah. really good principles. Love it. Um, you were in Haiti and you moved to the States. So tell us, tell us about this journey. And I'd love to know kind of when, when did family come into the picture along your journey? So you, you've had a major life change. When, when did you get kids? Like at what point did you have kids? Well, uh, I, I have my, uh, I moved in the U S at the age of 17, 16 going to 17. And, um, uh, for the first couple of years, it's more like about, Hey, let me try to find myself and exploring. And at the age of 21, I got married. Then from married and I got my first child at the age of 22, 22 and a half going to 23. So family, Jay, one of the thing about my, uh, I want to go back again. It's just, I, I grew up in a family where um, I did not see my father got married. I, although he was married, he, he got divorced before I could even, I could even remember. And I know that um, according to the statistic that we are the product of, uh, of our environment, even though now we at the verge where that could be somehow debating, but we had, we know we have data. So in reality, technically I was supposed to be mimicked that because my father and in, in himself, I, I, he, he, he testified to me. He said that son, you're a blessed man and you have something different. I did not have, but the thing is I did not know, uh, the importance of, of having a family to the point where my wife and my kids are so important to me until like one, one of the major incidents in my life, which is, we could talk about that later. But what happened is, uh, the family coming to my picture when I start to realize, okay, you know what? I want to have, uh, I want to have a kid. I want to have kids, but I don't want to have kids like I, like the way I grew up, I don't want to have kids to the point where I'm not going to be available. So what happened is from, 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 from the get go, I mean, I, I, I accept Jesus. I mean, I, I'm a person of faith. And, and when I, when I turn to Christ, I start to understand relationship from a whole nother concept. And that's become another tray for me, another foundation for me to say, you know what, this is so important. Meaning like I have to do relationship according to what the Bible gives me, the scriptures, then that I starting to look around and say, okay, well, how can that happen? Then me and my wife, we, we got married and got married in 2007. Then 2008, we have our first daughter. And for my daughter, then we got another kids in 2010 and 2011. Uh, we got a, uh, we got another child. Then that's why I feel like, okay, you know, at this point, you know, let's come together, even though in the, in the midst of our brokenness and we can do better and we can, and we will do better. So that mean in the whole, in, in and in, in a whole mindset, it's just like that concept of relationship got birth to me after 
I turn my life to Christ and I try to do life in a way that uh, that no will would help me and it help me not repeat the certain things I grew up when I was in Haiti. Got it. What was the what was this big life event? Well, the big life events, you know. <laughs> That was like that. That was that was amazing. I'm glad I know you asked that one. Well, uh, the 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 one which is I talk about in chapter three, uh, chapter yeah, chapter three, where I talk about where I was uh, I was having a hard time in in my life back in college, and I was dating this girl, and she was uh, uh, I thought she was gonna be the one, and uh, mm-hmm. and when I realized that she was not the one. And it broke my heart. And man, I spent a whole year trying to get myself together. But my wife, which is at that time was uh, not even a friend, not even a friend. She was like a acquaintance. And she came by uh, because in, in Austin, Texas, uh, there's not that many Haitian. When you came across a Haitian in Austin, Texas, it's just like, oh, man, you were Haitian. My, that's my people. Let's get together. So uh, that's kind of like how I met my wife. I was came from the air. I was came from uh, uh, Florida visiting the family. She, uh, she and my brother come pick me up at the airport, and I was talking, and I just leave me alone. It was a long flight, and that's how I met my wife. But during that process, I found that she would stop by more often, just like random because we we came from the same place. She was just checking on me, and at that point, I realized, you know what? Huh? There's something special about her. And I started talking to her. Yeah, so I met my wife uh, in Austin. I mean, we met, and after I got off the plane, it was great, all gravy. Then a uh, couple of months after, then uh, she just starting to come by, uh, starting to see her often, not directly talking to her, but the, the time that she's been around me, I'm starting to notice something special about her. Now, I break some rules, which is like I don't recommend people to go it that way, but it's some, somehow, some way, I got a green pass. So when I knew she was the one, I told her straight up. I didn't spend anything. I told her, hey, you know what? I believe that, you know what? You're the chosen one. Would you marry me? Just like that. Uh, you could ask, you could ask my wife if she was there, she would be like, okay, yeah, this is this is going weird. But she was like, well, uh, I, I don't know. But suddenly she could not resist. And she said, yes, but you know, we've been married for 14 years and we had some, some really struggle. We, we, we still struggle today, but I believe I love God stronger, stronger every day because she's been in my corner since 20 and at the age of 22 and I'm about to be 39. She's still around me. So life is good. Uh, we have some ups and downs and I'm blessed to have her in my life. Awesome. <laughs> that is, that is quite the story. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know, like there's going to be, I guarantee this, there's going to be a movie one day about this story. You're going <laughs> to, it's going to be like this. All right. It's gonna be the opening scene. And then like, you know, the main, the main character or, or maybe, maybe the supporting character walks up. So the man walks up to the woman is like, will you marry me? And then it's like everything after that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, man. I know we just met, but yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. uh, that is, um, and um, and I think that what it really illustrates for me is there's this real um, there's this real misconception that people have about marriage, yeah. and especially so specifically for the feel good fathers, it's we're not trained as much on the work of the relationship, yeah. and if you if you've made it for to that many years, right? Like you put in the work, you've you, you were saying that like, Hey, we've, we've struggled. We've, we've, we've had our ups and downs and like, this is what you've been intoning to us. And it's just like, okay, well, yeah, man, that's, that's like, that's life. That's, that's married life. And I love it. I love the fact that you've stuck with it and um, that you had, had the courage to, to, to ask and to, to build that life. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was pretty young. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Young, young fatherhood in your early twenties. Yeah. That's, um, that's pretty young. Yeah. So what, what was your experience with that? Man, I got to be honest with you, Jay. Um, one of the the experience I had was, uh, it was, uh, uh, um, I know she's the one. And my faith as well, it's another combination in the process too. To the point where my life was, uh, um, 
while I was working like uh, a minimum wage uh, jobs and to provide for the family that adding a whole nother stress into my life. I know as a father, as a young father, I mean, I know we want to provide for our kids, for our family. And this is one of the principles that we know this is part of identity. We want to be a good provider. And when that hit me, uh, Jay, it was really hard for me just to actually is showing love to my wife in a way that makes sense to her because all I'm thinking about paying the bills next month, all I'm thinking about, okay, you know what, what about if something happened to you, to us, what going to happen? So uh, this is one of the challenges. The second challenge is the communication problem because granted, I did not grow up in a home where that was mimic. I could have mimicked that. So to me, I was like, hey, I'm provide for you. If I could provide, I could do that. What I that's love to me until one time she told me, he says, Hey, listen, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not quoting her directly, but I'm paraphrasing. She's more like, Okay, I did not want to marry someone that will always want to work, but I always want you to be here with our family too. And uh, that seemed to be to the point where I just like, Okay, something got to be done. And uh, and last part, just to answer that question, and not with another story. Just I remember uh, when she was pregnant with our daughter, our second daughter, and uh, just telling you how bad things was. And um, she, I mean, on the, on the way back to work, she ran out of gas because uh, we were not on the same page with money. And when she called me in the middle of like four o'clock in Texas, traffic is horrible. And, and, and she called me, she's like, I ran out of gas. I just, oh, that was so, so hurt just to hear my wife. You know, she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. just, just hear it. I mean, I'm still trying to picture that. I mean, it's heavy. Just when I get that call, she, I tell like, she was like, well, there's no money to put gas on the car. I just said, oh, no, that's not what I want. And I realized at that point, not only because we were not communicating before, if I knew that was the case, I would not let that happen. And mm -hmm. and as a young uh, father out there, all I was trying to say, the message is just um, do your best to communicate with your, with, with your spouse and with one another where things are. I know for me as a man, I'm all like I'm goal-oriented. I'm so vision. I'm a visionary. I see things like, you know, far ahead, but sometimes there are little things that I don't see and, and those type of things. That's what actually got me in a lot of trouble and still today, but I'm way better than what I was. Sure. Before. <laughs> sure. Uh, so how are you, I mean, you have two daughters, right? And so you've had this really interesting journey. Yeah. Well, I guess let's take a step back. Let's take yeah. a step back here. So you were, I mean, you know, you were at the bottom, right? Not, not earning a lot, doing yeah. rough. Yeah. Like, and now you're, now you're supporting tech folks. Yeah. So what's the, let's bridge the gap here. Yeah. Let's talk about the, I mean, it's clear you've created the next part of your life. You created whatever that next chapter is. Yeah. So for the feel good fathers, you know, tell us what, what, what you created. What was that chapter look like? What does it look like? Yeah. So, uh, uh, at, at the birth of my daughter in two thousand um, in two thousand eight, after she get back from the hospital, uh, and I remember working working a lot, dead end job. My hours from seven p.m. to seven a.m. I barely got some time to sleep, and I would have little time with her. One morning, as I was working from the living room, uh, working from the from the room to the living room, I collapsed. I collapsed from the floor, almost busted my head from by the coffee table, a little closer while causing some damage to me. While I was on the floor, I heard a voice kind of like from a far distance calling, honey, honey. And, but I, I couldn't tell whether or not if it was her calling me, but the way the voice is sounding, that has to be her. And that floor, on that floor, I realized that there are people that expected that waiting that believe me and me to the point where I need to change things around the home. And I wake up to the floor with that question. What do you want to do about this? And that set in a journey to the point where I was just like, you know what? 
I need to make sure I grow my career to the point where I do not have to go to that process again. That's where my career journey in IT began. And I started like uh, ramp up my skills and uh, where I started to going back to the point where it says, okay, in order for me to get from where I'm at, from a career standpoint, into where I want to be to it, to like an engineer architect, I need to grow my skills. But I realized that it doesn't only apply to my career. It's applied to all the other areas of my life. This is the funny thing. So in, in 2008, right, the mm-hmm. internet wasn't what it was today. So today you can go get a Google certificate. You can, you can go to YouTube University and pretty much learn whatever it is that you need to do. But I, you know, I was around in 2008, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I sort of have a, a concept of what my experience was at that time. Yeah. Where, what did you learn? And I'm asking this very specifically because today it's easier and more simple to yeah. get the education, the skills you need to get there. If you got a smartphone and you got YouTube, you can figure it out. Yeah. Right. And it, tons of other, tons of other ways to do it. And yeah. what did you do specifically? Like, what did you learn? Like, cause going, going from, yeah. going from soft, like from non-software to yeah. system architect yeah, is a very, that's a, that's a different journey. That's a long journey. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Great question, Jay. What, what, what I did is just that desire, that drive to actually have a, a better career put me in a position where I was just like, you know what? Nobody going to come by and drop those things on my lap. So I started to just go out there and buying things back then and it was the big thing so i started buying like uh, equipment to to pretty much learn on my own that journey of a uh, of self learning starting to occur at that point and and in that process uh, there's a couple of uh, programs that starting enrolling in local community college to the point where it was even though it was a nine months back then now you could get it shorter than that so uh for me it's just like okay you know what those are the steps i had to follow meaning i got to get the books and i'm starting to read i'm starting to okay this is what he mean this is the scale in order for me to get to get that job, I need that type of skill set. Jay, I got to be honest with you, there's a lot of rejection in that process too. I mean, I got so many no's after I got those skills. Some some, some says like, you don't have the skills. So we're we not looking, but you know what? I'm always stay humble. I'm always believe. And this, this is actually my framework on the better, better life blueprint of my book. I said the first B, you have to believe that anything is possible. And that actually gave me the energy to keep going. I says like, you know, I only need one yes. And I got to the point where after I was able to uh, uh, obtain, like, get those those those, those skill set that the market needs. I just need I just I just need one yes. And that yes, take me almost like ten. I'm not. I'm gonna, let me see one. Let me see from 2008 till 2000. 10, I, it took me about two years to fully officially launch my career, like to the point where it's stable. Prior to that, it was like, you know what? You get something, it's cut off. You get something, it's cut off. But until 2010, this is where my career just been on a straight path to the point where I'm at today. I think one of the things I'm really reminded of Simon, Simon Sinek, and one of the things I'm really reflecting on here is there's a lot of millennials and Gen Zers that are kind of like, Oh, well, if I can't, if my first job out the gate yeah. isn't half a million dollars, it's not, it's not worth my time. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if that's going on anymore, but, uh, I remember it would have been about five years ago. There was a lot of movement of, uh, people were just not putting in the time, not putting yeah. in the effort, not, yeah. not, uh, wanting the, the fast, the fast way forward. Yeah. Right. And the stakes are pretty high. The stakes are, are, are very, very high to increase your earnings and provide for your family. So I totally get that. But as an example, I think for feel good fathers, as we're climbing things out, just having that destination in mind, moving forward and having that big why, right? We're a big fan here on the channel of man's search for meaning. If you, any sufficiently large why will overcome any, any what's, any house to get there. and you know, you're on the floor, you passed out from your work, 
you added. So here's the other thing too. You added more on your plate. You added education. You probably cut things out of your life um, that were eating up that time. Yeah. And then in two years you landed like, and I, I know it. So I know uh, even an entry level it job can be life changing money Oh yeah. Oh yeah. for a lot oh, of yeah. people. Oh yeah. So um, that's, I mean, you can, you can make it there and you yeah. can do it and you can change your stars. Yeah. My, my, my journey is similar, you know, like mine only took, mine took six, but I had education in code. Yeah. You know, when I, when I went into the video games, um, I had already had a background in computer science and I was already doing data analysis. So yeah. I had some, some tech and it work, yeah. but even then it was, it was, it wasn't even for me. It wasn't even a lot of no's. It was yeah. just a lot of silence. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just a lot of pushing out there and no response. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. So, um, how, what would be, you've done this, you've changed, you've, you've effectively changed your stars. You've yep. effectively, um, big fan of Heath Ledger here, folks. You changed your stars, moved to a different country new family. Yeah. Now you have, you have some daughters, you know, my yeah. eldest is around the age of, of your middle child. Yeah. And so what are you modeling for your children? Cause you have two girls and a, and a boy. So what are you yeah. modeling for your children and how is it, how are you going to address or what are you trying to instill for the next generation for your family? You know, uh, I'm i uh, I'm the type of person, uh, I mentor, uh, I'm a big, big believer in the next generation. And one of the scriptures I quote a lot is just anything is possible for those who believe. Mm -hmm. And outside of that, uh, uh, I've always tell them that, you know what? Don't limit yourself based on what you see. Believe that it is something that everyone has to go through. But at the end of the day, you could conquer anything that you face. What does that mean? So, but the the way I say that to them, because we we talking about the gen, uh, we got the alpha generation, and we got Gen Z, we got the millennial. So we got three different generation here. So we all see things different. But at the end of the day, if we boil everything down, it just come down to the point where, like you know what, you, we have to believe in ourselves that we have the capacity to rise regardless of your background, regardless mm -hmm. of where you came from, regardless of your social status, regardless of the parents who, who raised you, regardless of your color, regardless of those things, we have that ability to understand that one of the thing I says being, again, by teaching that worry lifestyle, which is like, this is the core, take ownership of your life. Taking ownership of your of your life. It's not like you said, okay, I'm the god of my life to the point that you know what I'm I'm saying I'm take over the world. Like you know, there is no creator. That's not what I mean. Take ownership. It's just like there's things that have been given to us, especially to this generation. For example, we know that technology, it's at the fingertip of this generation. Everywhere they go now, my kids gather the iPhone for Christmas. They have that. They they just they could do. Now I did not have that. I, I but as a matter of fact, I didn't have my phone until like my junior year in high school. Guess what? I paid for it. So that's the thing. I just like now they have something technology could give them, which is we did not have. Now there's there's what, what I tell them. I tell them all the time, use the tools that you have to better yourself or and better the world at the same time. Meaning we create, we maximize. We invent, we reinvent things. We make things better. Now, there's going to be some obstacle. Like for me, what I had to go through, yours going to be different. But at the same token, I, the fundamental is the same thing. I always believe that it's possible. That's actually one of the things that gave me the drive to go forward. Anything I'm facing, some challenges, I look back to where I came from back in Haiti. Little boy, that dream of living a better life. To where I'm at now, where I'm debt free. I got my family. Now I got a career where I'm making an impact on my community. But 30 some, plus, 30 some years ago, I did not see that. But I know that I believe there is something better out there. And then I've been operating in that mindset. And guess what? This is where things are today. I always believe, I always tell them, like, try to be better than the person that you were yesterday. Always try mm -hmm. to grow. Always try to improve. At the end of the day, sky is the limit. Absolutely love it. 
Doherty, if folks want to get a hold of you and they want to kind of see what you're up to and about, how can they do that? How can they do that? Great, great question. So, yeah, I mean, the, the one place they can find me, they can find me, uh, they can check me out at Solution for Better Life. Uh, that's just where we actually starting to launch a coaching and consulting firm to help the young professionals and uh, start a grow their professional career. And also they can find me on Instagram at the Doherty Pierre Paul. Uh, and Facebook as well. Find me as well. So Doherty Pierre Paul as well. Awesome. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you very much. Hey, please subscribe to the Phil Good Father YouTube channel is above your head. Go ahead, click that button now. You need to connect it. Your life will be transformed. Thank you. And also, the next video, according to YouTube, is right there. I hope it's one of mine. It's going to be a good one. You'll know it because it'll have that nice blue background. Feel good for that. That's the next one. Right there. Right there. Okay. Thanks, everybody.